Dark Commissar, that could be a good name for Facebook, too. Uh, since I called for names, uh, I'll take a couple quick calls before we get to our next guest on suggested name change for Facebook since they're in the process of and I have one for you changing. Peter Hernandez Peter Hernandez Bruno Mars oh that's a good one yeah Mike Scott tell me Peter Hernandez Mike Scott yeah. told me after he told me what his real name is that's a little too plain Jane though that would be like me saying Chris Jackson oh right Chris Jackson who went to uh, Mahmoud al Raouf, the basketball player um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You gotta. It's gotta be. It, the name has to be a little bit spicy. Like what did a, Brian Williams change his name to? Like a Maurice Micklethwaite from uh, the Bulls. What's that? From the Bulls, Brian Williams from the Bulls. Didn't he change his name? Uh, did this morning he did? I'll I'll look it up uh, while you take calls. I don't know. I'm on John it, and McHenry. You're on Chicago's Morning Answer. Yes, uh, name suggestion for Facebook, uh, using your Borg theme, Dan, we'll call it the Meta Collective. We take your personal metadata, and we cancel, assimilate you completely. It's not bad. Yeah, Bison Deal. Call, John. He changed his name to Bison Deal. Oh, yeah, I do remember that now. He was such a nice man. Hmm. Richard in Blue Island. Yeah, hey, Dan and Amy. Um, my suggestion is for Facebook is Mugshot Book, because if you don't follow their protocol, you're a criminal. All right. Amish Texter calling in on the oh, uh, Tin Cannon String Hotline. Big day. Good morning. Yeah, I think, uh, how about the Pierre Delecto, the social connecto? <laughs> I forgot Pierre <laughs> Delecto good. is available. Very good. All right, thanks, Amish. All right, we'll continue taking your calls and texts with some suggestions. That's a pretty good start. Uh, now we turn our attention to matters a, a bit more heady. Uh, and... Um, a good example of, I think, something that's outlined in our next guest's new book called Wrath was what happened at Netflix HQ yesterday when the trans employees of Netflix did a performative walkout to uh, express their opposition to Netflix platforming Dave Chappelle because, of course, that was transphobic and hateful. He can't tell jokes about people or even make keen observations that are not funny. They're just keen observations, as Chappelle did. Uh, one doughy white dude was there to be a counter protester with a. Uh, and I, and his sign was funny. He wrote, "Jokes right. are funny, and I like Dave." Yeah, we like Dave. We like was Dave. the sign. Yeah. We like Dave. That was his incendiary sign, and this is the reaction it drew from the horde. It's a stick from his sign. He's got a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want me to drop my weapon? Yes. Okay, Emily, there's my oh. weapon. We're not trying to have anything. I'm not stopping anything. People are crazy. I'm just here to say that jokes are funny, people. Dave Chappelle is a funny guy. And the uh, <laughs> the crazy lady with the person, like voodoo beads in yeah, front of his face shaking. I'm up. not sure that was a lady, but that person uh, that we have to bleep. She was screeching at him after they tore his sign down and claimed he had a weapon, which he then also claimed he had a weapon just to be <laughs> funny and being repetitive. Uh, it was screaming, "Repent, mf -er, Repent, mf -er, Repent, mf -er. That's what she was screaming. Uh, for comment on that. And uh, broadening this a bit uh, for sort of top line understandings. Pleased to be joined again by Peter Wood, who is the president of the National Association of Scholars and the author of the new book, Wrath America Enraged. Peter, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me back. Um, so, in, uh, in Wrath, your new book, you talk about uh, America's politics being dominated by anger across the spectrum but a new kind of anger. And um, I wonder if uh, what you heard, particularly from the woman or person screaming repent, 
is an example of the new kind of anger you write about. Yeah, it's uh, definitely an example. It's the the new anger, I mean performative anger, the show-off anger that uh, tries to drive its point by saying, look at me, I'm angry, I'm so angry, you need to listen to me. Um, It's not anger in the sense of uh, being truly overwhelmed by some uh, feeling of uh, uh, uncontrol. It's a very, actually, it only pretends to be uncontrolled. It is a a big, vituperative expression that is meant to uh, make the person who is uh, performing it admired by like-minded people. So uh, if you can get the press to pay attention to you and can get the applause of your fellow people, you've accomplished what you needed to. That's what I call new anger. And um, I think you've just found a perfect instance of it. So the left accuses the right of insurrection and the right accuses the left of fraud. So how did we get here? Well, uh, of course, we got here very quickly with the uh, 2020 election mischief and the the riot on Capitol Hill that got branded as an insurrection. Um, But before that quick turn to this uh, moment of real explosive anger on both sides, uh, I think we had a build-up to this, uh, and you can trace it back a long way, but the easiest thing to do is to go to the 2016 election and see how the left responded to the disappointment when Hillary failed to take the White House. Uh, And we had basically a riot in Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day, the pussy hat wearing women and uh, the cars burning in the street, um, which somehow didn't need the the National Guard or have barbed wire fences around the Capitol. Um, But we had there and on numerous occasions since, this um, display of the left's visceral hatred of people who disagree. Well, Trump is the embodiment of that, but uh, it goes well beyond Trump to all those deplorable millions of people, some 75 million or more, uh, who stand in the way of the progressive agenda. Uh, but uh, my my book um, and sort of my interest in this goes way back. I think that uh, you can look into American history and find not just a time, but um, several centuries of time in which Americans viewed these petulant displays of anger as childish and dangerous, and mature people learn to govern their feelings. Um, we are a self-governing people, both in the sense of uh, having a republic, which uh, is put in place, in theory anyway, by popular vote, but also self-governing in that we know how to control ourselves and behave in a civilized way. Didn't always succeed in doing that. We've had duels and uh, we've had a civil war and so forth, but the ethic that guided our personal lives for several centuries is grounded in this um, belief that self-control was what mature people did. That began to change as far back as the 1950s, and I spend time trying to trace out exactly how, what path was taken, but it was a slow development. You have to overcome a lot of natural reluctance in people to uh, think that behaving like a uh, three-year-old and having a tantrum is actually a good way to pursue your public life and uh, your politics. So by step by step, we made it there. Back when um, Bush beat Gore in the 2000 election, uh, the angry left really emerged as a force in its own right. It adopted anger as a lifestyle. Uh, it kind of blended in with the rise of social media, whereby people could get their anger fixed from the moment they got up in the morning, and if they chose, could sustain it all day long by slanging people on Facebook or using Twitter to denounce their imaginary enemies. Um, This was primarily a disease of the left, but the right was not immune to it. Diseases spread. If you spend a whole lot of time attacking people, eventually they're going to attack back. So we do have an anger on the right as well. I think the right's anger is more conflicted. Um, That is, a lot of people who are conservative 
are very angry right now, but they don't like being angry. They would prefer if we could get back to some kind of more civilized order. So the, the conflict is there, but then there's the obstacle that the left has now denied the right any opportunity at all to play a role in choosing the path of our government. We've had a stolen election. We've had uh, the, in many cases, innocent people who were at the Capitol on January 6th thrown in jail for 10 months or more uh, without serious charges, sometimes in solitary confinement. We have a, an ogreish government that is forcing people to do things that they find morally uh, objectionable. Um, a lot of the Tax mandate stuff is trampling on people's rights. And, in, and as this has transpired, we've had to watch the deterioration of both our economy and our national prestige. We did the cut and run in Afghanistan. We've abandoned any sense of order at our southern border. We've got container ships and backing up on both coasts. We've got the uh, world of uh, the COVID hysteria and climate hysteria and racial hysteria flooding in on us from every direction. And people who consider themselves conservatives, I think, are being pushed to what I said in the title of the book, wrath. Wrath well, is what happens when your anger has no way to go. Yeah, and there's a there's a bit of a two-step, it seems to me, that the left does. When they're not in power... There's the hysterics like you heard in front of Netflix headquarters yesterday. When they are in power, then it becomes very sanitized and they just use force at a very, but in a very room temperature way. So it's uh, the Department of Justice is going to label parents criticizing school board uh, policies as domestic terrorists. Um, it's going to, uh, we're going to have, uh, as you say, judges uh, arguably violate the constitutional rights of the accused as it relates to those who uh, broke the law on January 6th. So it's it's anger as the means to power, and then it's the imposition of force with sort of soothing, empathetic language. It's always in the, the uh, parlance of safety and saving lives and protecting people once they're in power. I think that's, that's perfectly put. Um... The, uh, the angry left now can turn on the anger when it wants to, but most of the time it tries to do this sort of uh, Biden-esque uh, sense of, oh, everything's all right, don't worry about it. Um, but we are worrying about it. I think the country is at an explosive point right now with the uh, denial of our civil rights and our political rights um, and the sense that uh, there's no recourse. Well, maybe there will be a recourse in the midterm elections next year, but a lot of people are worried that we may not have another fair election. Um, it's good to see that uh, Congress decided against uh, this bill, which would have put permanently in place the rules by which the 2020 election was run. But that battle is going to continue, and probably right up to the wire. One, um, one more example of the left's approach to these things. It's always interesting to note when they make calls for a renewed sense of civility in our dialogue or our politics. And we see that across the pond after the assassination of conservative member of parliament, David Amos, last week. It's all uh, this, you know, and this was after, an, an, you know, another MP had been assassinated a couple of years ago. Um, it's it's now it's about the civility. We need to think about uh, you know what we're doing in terms of maybe monitoring social media a little bit more closely and so on and so forth. They it's all that discussion because they don't want to address the fact that it's likely and it's being investigated as such that um, that MP David M S was murdered by a radicalized Islamist and they don't want to have that discussion. Certainly the left doesn't. The uh, multicultural left in the UK. Like they cannot admit that um, the radicalized Muslims in Britain have nothing but contempt for the rule of law. This MP was stabbed to death multiple times. He's a father of five young children, I believe. Um, the, uh, the, the world in which the left operates never finds any grounds at all to review its own approach to things. Um, 
we're seeing this uh, in the nation's schools with the rise of a kind of tyrannical regime of uh, neo-racism, the critical race theory and its various permutations. But anybody who criticizes it as being a dangerous uh, uh, ideologue, uh, we're told, or a domestic terrorist, as we just quoted our attorney general of the United States, uh, it's a uh, kind of heads I win, tails you lose approach to political dialogue, which gives people very little reason to even think we should have political dialogue. Mm. I, I am critical of the, that um, small but fairly loudly heard group of people who think that we can solve all these problems simply by sitting down with each other and talking them through. You can't really talk things through with people who treat you as either uh, lying all the time or uh, in, engaged in some kind of uh, delusional politics. And if you treat the right that way, the right's going to respond in kind. He is Peter Wood. He's the president of the National Association of Scholars, an organization that does great work fighting for uh, you know, intellectual heft and college campuses to be true marketplaces of ideas. The new book, Wrath, America in...